Good evening. I am Chastity Walker, the Community Initiatives Coordinator of ACO Co., the Community and Learning Initiative of Houston Grand Opera. Everyone, I'm Jeremy Johnson, uh, Houston Grand Opera's dramaturg, a resident opera nerd for Houston Grand Opera. And we've teamed up to bring you a new digital program for the 21-22 season, What If? The program is designed to set up a larger context of four of our productions with support from a couple of the artists in the show and sometimes with an expert in the field. And then we ask you, our audience, What If? Today, we bring you the second episode of What If, which will focus on world premiere opera, The Snowy Day, based on the classic children's book. This program is a part of the Seeking the Human Spirit, a six-year multidisciplinary initiative designed to highlight the universal spiritual themes raised in opera and to expand and deepen Houstonians' connections to opera and to art. Houston Grand Opera will present the world premiere of the Snowy Day on December 9th of this year. So coming up very soon, we're in the middle of rehearsals and we're all just so thrilled to be in rehearsals. The book was written in 1962 and awarded the Caldecott Medal in 1963. The Snowy Day broke the color barrier in mainstream publishing by being embraced across ethnic and social lines. Both book and opera recount the adventures of young Peter after he wakes up to the first snow of winter, the first winter when his parents have promised to let him play in the snow by himself. He sets off to explore, getting into adventures and learning lessons along the way. The Snowy Day, created by composer Joel Thompson and librettist Andrea Davis Pinckney, marks HGO's 72nd world premiere opera. Our first guest tonight is the librettist herself, Andrea Davis Pinckney. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Nice to be great here. to have you here. So great to see you again. And we can't wait to have you in town with us to uh, kick off this world premiere. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about uh, your process of turning this book into a libretto. Well, what, first of all, I, I, I don't know if you can hear those lovely sirens outside. This is New York City, which is making me all the more excited to come to Houston very soon. Um, to be with all of you anyway, but but the process, let me say, I love this theme of seeking the human spirit because that was at the heart of my process. And, you know, when when Patrick Summers, you know, invited me to participate as the librettist in this opera, I thought I had two emotions at the same time. Oh, goody, oh, dang, you know, oh, goody, because of course, who would not want to create a libretto based on the classic beloved children's book, The Snowy Day, and then oh, dang, because Peter, the main character, doesn't say anything, uh, nor do any of the characters that inhabit his world. So my process was, how do I bring this narrative theatrically alive? And my first thought was, and at the same time, stay true to what Ezra Jack Keats's story was and the heart of what he did so beautifully. And my first thought was that I wanted to expand the canvas on Peter's inner world and bring voice to that world. So that's what I sought to do. So that's the basis for so many of the, um, the, the, the poetry of the libretto. And then there are kind of these ancillary characters in the snowy day. There is a mother who plays a very uh, you know, ancillary kind of small role in the book itself. And I thought this is a golden moment to really build that character of mama. Uh, in the snowy day, Peter doesn't have a dad really, but in Ezra Jack Keats's books that come after the snowy day, we meet more of the dad. So I made a decision that I'm really gonna expand on this African-American family and these characters. Peter's friend, Amy, is a character that appears in future books and Amy now becomes a real character in the snowy day. So again, just elongating, expanding, growing Peter's world through the libretto and, 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 and all the time staying very true to what Ezra Jack Keats' original story is. And the, uh, the original story also, it was, it was Ezra's second book, is that right? I think it was his second book uh, of his own. 
Yes, that's right. Yeah, but it was it was it was the first one of kind of this world that he set up, and so it's kind of the first one of this. There's like a whole canon of books that uh, that you've referenced, kind of. Uh, even though you're telling like the plot of that first one, you and Omer and the design team went through and kind of referenced this whole canon of, of literature, not just the one book. Yes. So the snowy day is the first where we meet Peter and Ezra Jack Keats was really deliberate. And I'm going to just hold it up. I don't know if you can see it on my Zoom screen here, but this is the snowy day. And you'll notice that I'm holding up the 50th anniversary edition. So this book has stood the test of time with a lot of readers. And Ezra Jack Keats was very deliberate about featuring this African-American boy on the cover and throughout the book. And then Peter, he created a whole world with Peter. And, and that became, you know, part of the basis of the opera. And as you pointed out, Jeremy, just so much of the sets, the design, the characterizations, the world. Peter has a whole world that we're going to see on stage very soon. So let's talk a little bit more about the characters. That's the that's the annual theme for this year's Seeking the Human Spirit is is character. Um, so Peter's the main character, but we of course our our artist guest uh, in a little bit tonight is playing the role of Mama. The characters of Mama and Daddy hold really special significance in this story. Uh, what did you want to illustrate in these two characters? Tell us a little bit about them. Well, when Joelle Thompson and I met for the first time in a coffee shop in Manhattan. Uh, right across from Carnegie Hall, you know, we, we were almost, it, it was a, a dream meeting because we really came to it with the same ideas about this. Um, I've, I've learned that, you know, that's kind of rare that we both like agreed from day one, um, yeah. <laughs> but we, we excitedly did and we've continued to do that. Uh, and we both came to that coffee shop knowing that we wanted to depict a, an intact, strong, beautiful African-American family. So that's where we decided Peter is the child of mama and daddy. And, uh, and so we see this family, it becomes much more of a family story. And um, this idea of this mother, this African-American mother making a promise to her son that the next time it snows, I will allow you to go out on your own. And then we decided that we're going to touch upon you know, some of the racial reckoning that's gone on in this country, you know, kind of in this beautiful nuanced way, you know, that comes so alive through Joel's music. And this idea that this mother is letting her African-American child go outside in a hoodie on this snowy day and, and what that means to her. And, you know, some of the, the misgivings and the aria is mama's misgivings and how she feels about that. And uh, again, that's, kind of not really in the original story, but it is, you know, it is a reality that we're living with right now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, tell us more about Mama's Misgivings and, and writing it from your perspective, you know, not just as an author and a children's book author, but as a black mother yourself. Well, I am a mom, I have a son, I have a son and a daughter. And um, I, I think that Mama's Misgivings actually was probably the first poem of the libretto that I, I wrote. And I, I could not help but feel what that mother, you know, Peter's mom and so many of us mothers feel, especially now, you know, allowing our sons to have their independence, to, to put on those wings and fly, yet at the same time, looking out of the, 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 the figurative window of the world. And, you know, one of the refrains is, oh, how mama's eyes are watching this world. Oh, how mama's eyes are watching this world. And, and that's how I feel. And I know so many other mothers feel, you know, whether they're African-American or not, you know, mama's eyes watch the world on behalf of their children. And so, um, you know, when I hear the music that Joel has created, um, you know, we, we all, I think, can acknowledge that we, we become a little bit of a puddle um, in that moment. Um, it's such a powerful moment, but, you know, so many mamas are watching this world now and have always been and will always be. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really beautiful sentiment. And actually, I've got, I've got to maybe go on a little tangent here because I was just reminded of something. Uh, I was talking to another uh, librettist who's worked with Houston Grand Opera and, and HGO Co., uh, Deborah Mouton. Uh, and uh, a, a, just a, a, another fabulous writer. And she was saying uh, that from her perspective, there's no black mythology, right? She's, so she's, she started to come up with some sort of black mythology. 
and she she shared something with me, and it was it's a, a mythology story that she she thought up, and it's a, a beautiful short story, but it it tells the story of of how um, black mothers have eyes in the back of their heads, and that's one of the lines in your libretto that you wrote. Uh, when it, you know, got eyes in the back of her head, Daddy says about Mama. Uh, and tell us a little bit about about that scene, the bundling and mom and daddy and the interaction there. Yes, well, right. So, right. I I, I just say as a, as a black mom, as a mother, I have eyes like everywhere, you know, because I'm I'm always watching and looking. Um, and so the other piece is that we wanted this to really reflect the black experience, you know, um, Ezra Jack Keats what he did was he brought representation to children's literature, to stories for young people. And so again, taking it a step further, it was really important to me to go from representation to the experience of a black family. So there's a moment in the opera where, um, you know, called bundling where Peter's mama and daddy are kind of getting him ready for the snowy day and they're slathering him with Vaseline. That is something that every black mother I know has done and does. I, I do it with my own kids to block them from the wind. And so again, it's this kind of beautiful cultural moment where um, it's funny, it's, it's light, it's loving. And um, you know, mama is watching this world but she can feel a little bit of comfort because at least her child, at least Peter's cheeks will be protected from the slathering on that Vaseline. So there's, you know, it, it's, starts as a children's book and you've expanded this canvas as you so beautifully said. I mean, something I, I just really love about the work you've done on this libretto is how much poetry you've woven into it. I mean, it's really, it's really stunning it, you know, coming into it. Now we've been part of this process together for three, maybe four years now and kind of hard to, hard to imagine, but you know, even just the other day in rehearsal, listening to, to there was some other line and I, I won't be able to remember off the top of my head, but there's just always more to discover. And what, what I wanna talk about now is, is this, this poetry you've, you've discovered. And I know this was part of the process talking with Joel and our director, Omer, uh, about this, this idea of impermanence, the idea of loss, the idea of nothing really lasting forever. You know, there's even a musical theme in, in the opera that Joel calls the forever theme, uh, when, of course, Peter asks for the snow to last forever. Um, but we have that same type of perspective and, and relation between Mama and Peter as Peter has with his snowball, almost. It, it, it feels like a really strong poetic parallel. Could you talk to us about that? Yes, thank you so much for noticing, you know, and for for pointing that out, Jeremy. And, and, and also let me say that it reminds me that so many people are going to bring their own perspective and lens to, to so many nuances of the, of, the, of the libretto and of the opera itself. Um, so yes, there are a, a couple things. So it's this moment in the story where Peter does take the snowball, puts it in his pocket, expects that it's gonna be there in the morning. And we all know that a snowball won't be there when you wake up. Um, and so there's a few numbers. Okay, so one of, again, one of the ones I really enjoyed creating is called Whisper Walk. And so this is where Peter is out in the snow, quietly contemplative, f finding himself. When he gets to the point where he's ready to make that snowball and put it in his pocket, he professes love for the snowball. You know, he says, he says, Snowball, I love you. And so here is, is his great love. And it is, it's like a, a mama, you know, to a, to a young, a young little ball in her life professing love, you know, and, and Peter finds that that love is, you know, it, it melts, but then he can wake up in the morning and discover a new enchantment because the snow has fallen during the night. And it's, it's kind of one of those lessons that this little red birdie, I like to call him, you know, this little red snowbird learns um, as, as part of his kind of coming of age journey. Yeah, one, one of the lessons I, I heard often you and Joel talking about is the idea of, you know, living life and sharing it with others. Talk to us about Peter growing over the course of this opera um, and kind of his maybe isolated and independent nature and how that maybe changes throughout it. Yes, yeah, so he embarks on his own. He starts out alone, 
whisper walk, he's quiet, he's on his own. Then he encounters these big boys, you know, who are pelting snowballs at him and they're the meanies and the bullies, which by the way, um, during our kind of workshop in, in New Haven, Connecticut, uh, about, what was it? I'm, I'm lost in COVID time, but I'm gonna say 18 months ago, um, you know, we, we kind of came to this idea that the boys really aren't bullies. They're just kind of these bumbling kids who are all about fun and Peter is the little guy and they kind of make fun of him. But then he makes a friend, Amy. So Amy becomes kind of his, his real buddy and they have so much in common, you know, they, you know, she's kind of the odd one out because she's a girl, you know, we've, we've rendered her as a Latin A character. And so where Peter starts out alone, he is weathering the storm of kids that are bigger than him and, and, you know, pelting him with snowballs. And then he meets Amy and they're kind of these kindred, these kindred souls, these two kids, they, they get on the sled, they ride together and their, their joy is, um, you know, comes, comes together and they, they kind of, I don't want to give too much away, but, you know, they end as friends and Peter didn't, didn't have that when he embarked. So he went out on his own and he, he came home with a buddy. Yeah. And, and it's, it, it, it leads up to something that I, I honestly find just one of the most beautiful moments of the entire opera. And it's, it's probably not what you're expecting. It's just this tiny little line in the, in the, in the middle of, uh, it's, it's when Peter comes back home. Uh, Karen will know exactly what I'm talking about. I love to hear what Karen thinks about this once we, once we uh, bring Karen on. But I, there's a moment where Peter just recounting his day, how much fun he had out in the snow. He says, and I made a friend. And then mama goes, a friend, baby? And it's, it's, it's this tiny little part and it's just so beautiful. And, and it, it's almost one of those like break your heart moments about the, the mother and son relationship. Uh, talk yeah. to us about that moment. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's break your heart and expand it, you know, at the same time, because she, she had to let go. Mama had to let, again, let that little red birdie fly on his own. And it was an indication, or it is in my mind to her, that he, he came home, he's okay, and he has a friend now. So, you know, I, you know, and again, I feel this as a parent, you know, it's, it's not just me. There, there are people in this world who, who got you, who got your back, who are going to be there for you. Um, and so, you know, again, it's just, you know, and then, and then I wanted to say that daddy also, you know, he, he is there for Peter. He's, he's, the, he's a comforting presence. Um, throughout, you know, and especially when Peter gets back and has a bad dream, you know, there's daddy, you know, bringing on so much comfort and, and, and love and, and joy and, and this idea that, that, we, that we can trust that our children will be okay in the world. That's beautiful. Well, thank you, Andrea. So I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to my co-host Chastity. Now we're gonna bring on Chastity and Karen, and uh, Karen will be performing the role of Mama in the Snowy Day. Uh, so let's move on to our next segment and uh, welcome uh, Karen and Chastity. Hello, hi Karen. Hi Chastity, how are you? Good. How are you? You enjoying Houston? Yeah, yeah. I'll be happy when we when we get out everything going and I can really enjoy the city. <laughs> It's coming soon. Um, so now that we got to hear um, Andre give us a bit more about the context of the story and um, how she developed this libretto out of this storybook where, like she said, Peter doesn't say anything. We want to kind of get into the perspective of the singer. It's a different kind of storytelling, as we know. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to do a little bit of you know, exploring what goes into the background work before it even hits the stage. And I want to ask you, how do you approach learning a new role? Well, you know, learning a new role, when you're learning a new role in a world premiere, it's a whole other experience than learning traditional uh, Verdi, Puccini, or all the, all the, the roles that you, as a young singer, grow up listening to, aspiring to sing one day, you know, it's very different. <laughs> but um, for me, I always start, if it's, if it's um, a new role, of course, listening to lots of recordings, you know, I'm somebody who loves the old school singer. So um, I do that, and then, and then I immediately go to the libretto to find out what, what actually is happening in the story, you know? 
And um, as far as new world premieres, I mean, I, again, goes to the story, you know, finding out uh, where the story, where it was birthed, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and speaking of going to the story and, and, and seeing what's in there, um, I want to kind of ask you, th this story is special in its own way because of who the librettist is, who the composer is, the times that we're living in where opera is really trying to kind of change its ways a little bit and, and be more representational of African Americans. And then the story itself, it's not a, a, a typical story where we would see, um, you know, you know, where we want to talk about slavery or what have you. This is a story about a little boy, an everyday mm -hmm. story that everyone can relate to. And we get to see that with a Black family, as Andrea said, showing the Black family experience and, and, and just representing that. And so did that in any way influence how you approach this role? And if so, in what ways? Well, you know, I have to say this is probably my one, two, three, four, fifth mother <laughs> that I've played <laughs> in new works. I've played, um, I've done Scylla and Margaret Garner, Emilda and Champion. I created the role of Billy in Fire Shut Up In My Bones and um, the mother in Yardbird. So I've played a lot of black mamas in opera. So I have lots of experience. <laughs> I don't know where that happened in my career where I became like somebody's mama, you know? <laughs> So, um, no, I, you know, the difference between this role is that the kid, the, my ch it's a child, the kid is really young and that you see the father and you see the mother and the father, the, the beautiful black family that love each other and that are, you know, passionately in love with their child. And that's what's different. And I think um, it is important that we see more of that. And that's why, partly why I really loved doing this mom is that I actually have a husband and I can show how I grew up, how I grew up. I grew up with my dad, very loving, my mother and my father. So I, um, while I don't have children of my own, um, I can call upon my own experiences as, you know, having grown up in a two parent household. And it's just wonderful. We need to just see more of that in opera and yeah. Absolutely, I agree. Um, it's going to be a beautiful thing to witness. I can't wait to watch it. Um, so my next question is, we, we got to hear Andre's take on who Mama is. Mm -hmm. And so now I want to know how do you interpret that, that, that being that is Mama? You touched on it a little bit, but if you can go a little bit deeper, what's laying under the surface? Who is Mama and what is her role in this story? Well, I think she's like every, like many, many moms, like worried uh, and, and passionately in love with her child. That's what I have to say. Like they, Peter and mama's relationship is a very special. It's very, um, I don't want to say unique because I think that many, many moms <laughs> are passionately in love with their sons. But, um, you know, what I, I, Joel wrote a gorgeous score to this and, and he makes it very easy actually for you to express and then with Andrea's incredibly beautiful and poetic as Jeremy said her words it just it just makes it to me very apparent very easy to interpret you know it is just the warmth and the light and the beauty of um of the black experience you know this it's I, <laughs> when I was reading the score and I was listening to the the midi I was like wow you know, you hear the jazz, the blues, the, you know, all of those things. And I'm like, this is just beautiful that we can just step in to our, our culture and, and share it, you know, with the world. So I don't know. I, I don't want to make it too deep about mama because it's not, it's not, it's not like this, there's nothing tragic or trauma around it. So I, I don't want to add anything to it. But what I love is that you she gets to, every mom can relate to their kid going out for the very first time and the anxiety and the nervousness and kind of like the letting go um, part of it. You know, we were all kids and I grew up in Philadelphia. So, you know, as long as you were home before the street light came on, <laughs> you were okay. But I'm sure my mom was a nervous wreck the first time I'd gone out. So I, I think that it's it's just every mom will be able to relate to, to this character. Hmm, that's, I, I love that. That's absolutely beautiful, especially 
I just go back to the media and, and the representation that we usually receive. And, and this is a story one of a kind where you get to see a whole family um, living, being everyday trials and uh, regular things that, like you said, moms go through um, and just being able to relate to everyone. And I love mm -hmm. that. So my next question would be, um, you talked a little bit about Joelle's music and how it made it easy. Um, so what character choices do you think is made for you by the music? You know, I mean, I, it, I hate this word sassy because that's not really the word that I want to use, but there are times where she, he leaves space for her to give him a look. You know, that look that your mom gives you, she doesn't even have to say anything, <laughs> you know, and the music and then Andrea's text just, it, it always sets you up and prepares you so beautifully for the moments, for the loving moments, for the, the uh, moments where Peter is a little smart. He's a little smarty pants. He, you know, he makes little comments and he says like, we all do under our breath. <laughs> when our parents, you know, try to tell us to do something and we want to do something else. So it's just so beautifully laid out. It's very exquisite. You know, um, it's because I, because I sing a lot of standard repertoire, I'm always finding myself, you know, in the big Italian pieces, trying to find the real, trying to find what story it is that I want to tell. Um, and try, like when I sing Tosca, I try to make her more, earthy than flighty then you know what I mean and so in this piece how Andrea and Joelle sets it up so perfectly it's like this is home for me so I just all I do is put my voice and my expression on top of them laying everything out so beautifully so it makes it very 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 easy to uh, to interpret wow I love that um the next question, and I know you say that you don't want to make mom a little too deep, and you can even attest this to Peter's character. Uh, what choices do you think in, in the snowy day kind of sets things into motion? What, what gets the story moving? <laughs> when he meets Amy, I think, <laughs> when he goes out and he has all these experiences and he meets Amy and then he meets the bullies and, and he really is sort of growing up right before our eyes with all of the experiences like Andrew talked about, you know, he brings the snowball back home and he's so in love with it and, he, and it melts. You know what I mean? Like that's a, that's a story in itself, like that nothing really lasts forever, you know? Um, but of course, then we can make another snowball because it snowed overnight. And so there you go. But um, it, you know, I just want to add this to this, to the, um, to the conversation, you know, I would love it with, if when we tell more stories, more, more black stories that we tell stories about women and, you know, because I play so many moms, it's like, you always play somebody's mom, somebody's wife, somebody's sister. And I really would love that. I think more black women's stories need to be told, you know, it would be wonderful to, 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 to know as, as a, as mom playing mom, like how she got to where she is now, you know, and, and as someone who interprets you know, as an interpreter, I'm like always hungry for more stories and I have to create them, of course, before I get on the stage and all that. But I would love to see more stories about Black women, whether historic or, or you know, fictional and not around trauma, around triumph and beauty. I think that just, I want to add, I just wanted to add that part. Yeah, I love that. I, I mean, honestly, that's, that's, that's what this series actually is all about. It's called What If? And um, so what if you could make your own story or that leads me to my next question what if anything would you change about mama and what more would you add in her role you know i i don't think i would add anything extra to it i um we've already made our our i said that dad is like a, a um a plant singer at the met <laughs> We created this whole like <laughs> the, 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 he, you know, he sings all the small roles at the Met, you know, because when he leaves and he comes in, it says, "Honey, I'm off to work," you know, um, <laughs> and then you know, mom was an executive, but now she's, you know, that she she's home, she homeschools and all that. So we've created in, in rehearsals already the conversations around these characters. Um, what I would love is again, like maybe another another book written you know the, because there's several books in the series but I think it's just it's beautiful I wouldn't add anything and the soprano gets an aria and what what more can you ask for 
That's what a we beautiful all aria. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Karen. I can't wait to see the show and witness this for myself. I know it's going to be amazing. Yes. Um, now to our audience, now that you've learned more of the dramatic context and the story of Snowy Day, we're ready to send you into breakout rooms so you can participate. So your prompt for today's what if is put yourself in Peter's shoes. What if you had only one day all to yourself in the snow? Imagine you're not in Houston. <laughs> Um, what brings you joy in the winter? And, and think about one special memory from your childhood that makes you think of holiday magic. If there was a song playing under your memory, what would it be? Select one person in your room to take notes and then we will all come back together and we'll share our stories. Thank you. Welcome back. Hello. So as you guys come back into the room, feel free to turn your cameras on. Um, and turn your mics on. We're waiting for people to come back here. About 10 seconds. Oh, welcome back. I think we have everyone back now. I hope you guys okay. have your sessions. Um, feel free to turn your cameras on. Uh, feel free to turn your mics on. We're going to invite you all to share. Um, I'm not sure how many breakout rooms there were, but if anyone wants to share what you discuss in your groups and um, if you want to share your own personal magical moment or if you want to share some of your friends' magical moment that were in the breakout rooms with you, uh, go ahead. Feel free to do so now, anybody. Oh, nobody wants to share. 
Good, Rosemary, oh, you're I'm muted. Uh, Rosemary looked like she was talking, but she was muted. Uh, Rosemary. Ah, I'm unmuted. Uh, <laughs> as an aside, the one of the Christmas stamps this year is uh, the little boy. Have you seen the Christmas stamp? Mm -hmm. you yes, have yes, this, there are, do you mean the Snowy Day series? Yes, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they had it last year and maybe because of COVID, uh, they had the stamp again this year. And so I just ordered from the post office, a hundred stamps of the Snowy Day little boy. Oh my, I'm gonna have to get some. Good. Yeah. Um, anybody else want to share? Sure, I'll share. I was just talking about how growing up in Philadelphia, I, um, <laughs> I love Christmas. I love, I, you know, I was the only child, oh. so I have a great memory of getting lots of toys and, <laughs> and going out in the snow too, you know. Um, I said, if I was Peter, I would have fought back. I probably would have beat everybody. <laughs> Not that I was like aggressive or anything, but like, you know, I would have... Got my licks in, you know. <laughs> um, uh, my favorite, like, holiday, I love, it's the most wonderful time of the year. And I love all I want for Christmas is you. All my friends hate it because I'm always turning my Christmas music up loud. And um, <laughs> I love this time of the year. I was, I was um, listening to uh, The View a couple of weeks ago and Sonny Houston was talking about Snowy Day. And I was like, oh my God, maybe she'll come. Like somebody needs to like tell. She said that was her favorite book her favorite short one of her favorite children's books and so um I, I love that and so I've been talking a lot about snowy day just talking a lot about like I think every opera company should do this piece for this time of the year up until like you know all the way through Black History Month right up until March you get to Women's History Month right <laughs> you know just this time it's just such an incredible incredible piece but um it just it, it's magical even from the first the first um the chorus of the first movement of Snowy Day is just, oh, it just puts you right in the space, you know? I love that. It's almost like the oh. opera Nutcracker. It could be- Yeah. Fantastic. We hope, we hope, fingers crossed for that. It's um, better. <laughs> I will share from our group, we were, we were a small group, but um, we, focused on this idea of wonder because I shared that wasn't a Christmas. Well, I did have a Christmas snow memory, but my first experience of snow was as an adult. And I lived in Western Pennsylvania on a road, a dead end road with three houses and lots of woods. It was an old apple orchard. And so for me, I walking my dog in the new fallen snow, when the world is quiet, it's muffled, it's beautiful, it's clean. And this sense of wonder, you know, that Peter has when he sees it. And for me, I discovered that as an adult. So we talked about that, the theme of like wonder and how when Peter tries to save it, save the snowballs, they melt. So that's another life lesson that we discussed in our group. Somebody else introduced this idea that this life lesson this joy was transitory, but there's a new day and more snow. And he takes a snowball and throws it to Amy. And so the idea that, yes, you know, you can be in awe of something, it doesn't last, but that doesn't mean you don't find joy again. So I just think that the hope, there are so many themes and messages in that little book. It's just incredible. You know, the power of that little book is just absolutely amazing. So I look forward to seeing you at the dress rehearsal and then uh, the real deal later. So really looking forward to this. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That was actually profound, that, that lesson in, you know, it leaves and it comes back and sometimes it comes back in another form. I love that. Would anybody else like to share? Well, as, as a New Yorker, I think I grew up in one of the most beautiful cities in the whole wide world when it comes to Christmas. 
And my my thoughts aren't as, yeah, my thoughts are as profound as hers, walking in the meadow. Mine is being beat up with snowballs and never, I've never been able to form a snowball that I could throw. I, I've lost every snowball fight I've ever been in, but I still love Christmas. I still love snow. It's the most wonderful time of the year and the music. Think about it. Think about New York on a silent night, the window dressings walking along. It's just beautiful. Even chestnuts over at the park, piping hot. Well, those are my memories and a lot of people come for them. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Oh, you never got beaten up with the snowball? You know, I'm from Houston. So Oh my God. <laughs> oh, oh, you poor deprived kid. <laughs> oh, we gotta get some snowballs here. We'll take and the ones off the stage and beat you up. Actually, one of my memories is because I was relating to Peter uh, when his snowball melted. When I was in sixth grade, we got snow here in Houston for just one night. And so it wasn't much. And I, I made a snowball and I tried to save it just like Peter. I didn't put it in my pocket, but <laughs> I put it in the freezer. I, I put it in the freezer because I said, you know, the freezer will freeze the ice. And um, my little brother ate my snowball. So I didn't get to keep it. Um, oh, there, was- there you go. Someone who ate snowball. <laughs> I spoke of snow cream, ice cream. Yeah. Snow tastes good the first time it, <laughs> when it doesn't get yeah. dirty. <laughs> oh my gosh. I just oh wish God. I could form a, I wish I could make a snowball. Are you in New York now? I beg your pardon? Are you in New York now? Or are you? Oh no, I'm here in Houston. That's, we were talking about memories. Um, music, growing up with snow, without snow, but we had snow. And uh, it's a it's just a beautiful time of the year that everyone has great memories or some type of memory and and loves that period of time no matter who you are. Love that. Would anyone else here like to share? We have a few friends here who haven't shared. Well, I'll just share what I just popped in the chat for those of you who are in Houston. The plan is, and let's hope we don't have an A degree December day, right? <laughs> yes. The plan is though that we will on opening night have some snow on uh, Fish Plaza in front of the Wortham. Oh, so fantastic. You can try your hand at the it. balls oh one, more <laughs> one more time. One more time. Oh my gosh. Maybe we'll have and, someone and, there who can like- and as, yeah, and as you say, it must be the technique. So I've mm-hmm. got to get it right. I, somebody's going to teach me once and for all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's thank amazing. Thank you all so much. Um, it's been a pleasure um, talking to both of you. And I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up here. Um, I'm glad everyone was able to share their magical moments. And I was glad to hear a lot of them. And I'm looking forward to watching the Snowy Day live and in person. And we're so glad that those of you who joined us tonight were able to be here. Uh, We wanna invite you for our next What If, uh, which is not coming back until the new year uh, on January 12th, where we will be discussing Dialogues of the Carmelites. Uh, Be sure to like and share this video and follow us on Facebook and YouTube for up-to-date program and event details. Tickets are still available for ACL's world premiere, The Snowy Day. And if you don't already have, have your tickets, head over to Asian site to book your seats today. Um, there is a promotion code for 20% off. Um, I'm going to ask if Emily can put that in the chat as well. And the promo code is EG Snowy. Um, for more information about upcoming programming offered by ACO Co., visit ACO.org. Good night. See you guys soon.